My name is Richard McCarthy, and um, I am the executive director for Slow Food USA. Um, I am uh, calling in from our uh, hub of activity on the East Coast, the national office in Brooklyn. And uh, I uh, do want to remind you that this is, uh, you know, the beginning of September of 2018. We are just, um, gosh, two months or six weeks since our um, uh, really remarkable gathering in, in Denver, Colorado, the National Town Hall, the, the um, Slow Food Nations, where many of these conversations and issues that we hope to, to cover in this hour, um, uh, it began many uh, conversations there. Um, we, we are just starting our annual September membership campaign. This is the one time of the year where we come together and, and, and contribute to the national entity, the national membership, and uh, reminding us that we are members of a global um, food community of Slow Food International. Uh, some of the key dates that are on the, the calendar is the Give What You Can Day, a wonderful popular date that's coming up this Saturday. This is where members can join at any level. Um, the, the theme, of course, is come to the table, which is what we hope people will do as we, we forge a, a broader and, and wider food movement. There's some wonderful premiums that uh, some of the exhibitors at Slow Food Nations have provided. And you can go onto our social media uh, threads to find things like B Squared Honey and uh, some marvelous uh, JQ Dickinson salts. Uh, there we go. It's, it's like I'm. I'm uh, and this is from West Virginia. So really interesting products that we know are, um, you know, hidden throughout our um, uh, complex web of a food movement. Uh, there are also some challenge grants later in the month. And um, we know that many of us later in the month will be in, um, in Turin for Terra Madre. So this is a very exciting time in our, um, in our, in our work. Um, we are thrilled to have a remarkable team join us from hopefully all over the world if the technology works uh, for this national town hall call to really dive into the question of slow food as um, uh, a network of communities rather than that historic idea that we are a um, membership organization with chapters and uh, sort of strong social ties that are very closely knit into thinking what is evolving in this ecosystem, much more fluid and open communities that um, comprise a global network. And uh, you can see if you're, if you're on the computer, you can see on the screen, um, there are many different ways in which people touch and join in slow food, whether as members of the Chef's Alliance or the thematic communities um, <laughs> like Slow Fish. Um, and, um, I think that you know some of the, the the intercultural skills and the competencies to stitch together these communities with equity and justice is something that we are all struggling to learn how to do better. And this is what we we hope to 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 bring into the discussion today, um, led by um, one of the, the the leaders in the international slow food movement. Uh, is Melissa Nelson. And if you again, you're on the computer, you can see Melissa sitting there in California, right? You are in California. I am. Um, she is a uh, native ecologist, a writer, uh, a media maker, and an indigenous scholar and activist. She's president of the Cultural Conservancy and has played a, um, uh, a really key role in trying to um, forge this exciting uh, network in Slow Food that's part of the International Indigenous Terra Madre Network, and, and that is of um, the uh, Slow Food Turtle Island Association. And um, Melissa, um, I, I maybe, maybe what I'll do is I'll go ahead and introduce everyone who's on the call, and then I'll turn it to you to kind of, you know, start the conversations. Pauline, I'm thrilled to see that, that, that you've now joined us and you have overcome those challenges with um, technology that um, I know I struggle with. Um, you're on the go to meeting call. Um, uh, you can also see that we've got John Eichert here. Um, John Kariuki, um, whose photo I've got up there, I don't think has been able to call in yet. You know, and, and in Kenya, we'll see. I know it's later at night for him. Um, but we're thrilled to have Pauline there. 
uh, Pauline mm -hmm. Trebasket, who many of you may have met uh, at, um, uh, at Slow Food Nations in Denver, uh, is a proud Celix woman, a member of the Celix Okanagan Nation, and exec executive director of the Okanagan Nation Alliance. And uh, I cannot wait to hear more about um, the work um, with um, the sockeye salmon, who's uh, many of you got to taste in Denver. And I first learned in my first meeting that I attended the uh, national meeting in Canada. I was really enthralled with the, 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 the community building woven into the economic development work in the Okanagan community. Um, and uh, I don't think we've got John yet. Uh, but we do have John Eichard, and many of you got to hear John Eichard may have read John's books. He's a professor emer em emeritus of agricultural economics at the University of Missouri uh, in Columbia, and um, spoke uh, really eloquently about having to, you know, relearn, many of us <laughs> middle age relearning what it means to, to forge community and with whom and how. And um, so we thought this would be a really rich continuation of some of the conversations we had um, in Denver about um, how we, 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 we forge ties and use food as a bridge between communities. And um, with that, I think I'll stop talking. I will be monitoring for those of you on the call. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll be monitoring the, the chat function. By all means, use the chat function for questions. And as we get going, um, we'll be able to, to, to field some of those. And if I could also just, just cite very quickly that Ludovico Rochatello from Slow Food International is also on the call. And he'll be monitoring the, the chat function if you have any questions about something that you will see in uh, Terra Madre is the Slow Food Communities and how are we forging these elements into our network. Um, so Melissa, over to you and I'll, um, I'll mute myself and be quiet and I can't wait to hear uh, where we go. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Um, greetings, relatives. I hope you had a good morning so far. I'm very honored to be uh, here with you all for the National Town Hall call. Uh, to speak a little bit about the importance of food for the Native American community. I'm a proud member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa tribe from North Dakota. I'm, so I'm Anishinaabe, Cree, Métis, and Norwegian from my father. Uh, so my whole life I've been bridging and uh, bridging cultures uh, in my own ancestry in the food system. I eating a variety of foods from my heritage, my mother and father's heritage, as well as growing up as a uh, neighbor, a visitor, a settler on California Indian lands here in California. So I currently live in uh, Coast Miwok territory in the North Bay of San Francisco Bay Area. I work on the Ohlone lands in San Francisco um, through the Cultural Conservancy in San Francisco State University. I'm very, very blessed to have a network of native food producers and food networks through Slow Food Turtle Island Association, the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, uh, Indigenous Terra Madre, uh, and a number of other uh, formal and informal food networks um, throughout what we call Turtle Island. And the reason we call our association Turtle Island is because in our Anishinaabe, in the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, Iroquois, in many, many nations, not all, but in many of the over 500 nations in the US, our creation stories talk about uh, North America emerging from the oceans, emerging like an island on turtles back. So we felt that that was a fitting a uh, way to describe our association as Turtle Island people, to really re-indigenize the names for ourselves, even in the English language. So as many of you know, the um, native food traditions are very rich in dynamic cuisines, and sadly they were um, brutally disrupted during the colonial period, um, forbidden to fish and hunt, uh, the decimation of the buffalo, um, the dams that prevented the salmon from coming up to the people uh, like Pauline's people and others in the Pacific Northwest, um, the 
you know, cut, cutting of forests, um, all of those had devastating consequences for the food security and health of Native Americans. Uh, so we've been in a process of uh, restoration and revitalization uh, to bring back uh, our traditional foods and seeds. Some cultures like the Pueblos of the Southwest and the great um, Six Nations of the Northeast have maintained a lot of their seeds, their heirloom seeds, like the Iroquois white corn um, or the Pueblo beans, and have continued a strong tradition um, despite all the challenges of um, and disruptions of colonialism and private property and uh, government regulations. So um, there's always been Native people eating and preparing and using their foods, um, although many nations were completely stripped of that and had to rely on commodity foods, uh, which are government uh, rations foods. And that had devastating consequences on our health. That's why we have a diabetes epidemic um, in our communities, largely because of these imposed commodity foods and the lack of access to our traditional foods. Um, so about, I got involved maybe about 20 years ago with a number of Native American communities really wanting to bring back these traditional foods. And then fast forward to 2006, 2004 and 2006, the first Slow Food Terra Madre uh, convenings in Italy. And there were a number of delegates who went. Uh, Pauline, were you on some of those first early delegations? Oh. Let's see, we've got to get your mic on. That little green button on the right where it says mute or not mute, maybe click that and you'll come on. We want to hear your beautiful voice. All right, well, while you try that one, so in, there were about 50 Native Americans who went to that first slow food Terra Madre in Italy, um, probably about 20 in 2004 and about 55 in 2006. And we were so inspired to meet other people, other communities, indigenous leaders from Africa, Asia, uh, Australia, the Sami people of Norway and, and Scandinavia. Uh, that we really were excited to be a part of this global network of indigenous food communities and all food communities. So we got involved with Slow Food pretty, pretty explicitly and we started to develop informal networks of you know, corn farmers, of salmon fisher people, um, of traditional gathers of seeds and bulbs and nuts and um, you know, underground like what we call Indian potatoes. And just informally started sharing those food traditions with each other through gatherings. And um, really 10 years later in um, 2016, uh, Winona LaDuke has been one of our great leaders and she early on got involved with the slow food movement through the protection of our monomen, our wild rice that was being threatened by genetic modification and because a lot of um, uh, farmers were draining their lakes and losing the, the wild rice crops. Um, and also then people started domesticating the wild rice and growing it here in California as a domestic crop. Um, so it was losing its wild rice qualities. And Winona LaDuke was very concerned about that and spoke to Slow Food uh, about it and um, created the first native presidia and um, it's on the Ark of Taste and um, really started want to protect it more and build this partnership and this alliance with Slow Food to create better understanding about Native American food security, food sovereignty issues and concerns. So Winona LaDuke has been our great uh, visionary and leader in this partnership. And so in 2016, right. yeah, Yep, 10 years after that historic large delegation in Italy, we for officially formed our Slow Food Turtle Island Association uh, to become kind of a sovereign space. We would always go through either Slow Food USA, which was, you know, fine, or Slow Food Canada or Slow Food Hawaii for our Hawaiian brothers and sisters. But we realized we really needed our own association um, to advance our 
uh, indigenous agenda of our own food sovereignty. So in 2016, we um, created a steering committee in Taos, New Mexico. With We had about 25 people there, um, many people um, from all the four directions. And uh, we developed uh, kind of some guiding principles and values, our mission, our name. And uh, here we are sending another delegation of about 40 people to Italy in a week or two. And uh, Pauline is going. Um, and we're going to have wonderful representatives. We tried to have a lot of youth attend this time. So we have several teenagers, young Native people, young people in their 20s. And the food movement has completely caught on and it's a wonderful way to bridge with um, ally communities and intertribally and globally. Um, we all love to eat, we all love to share seeds and recipes. And so uh, we have a number of goals related to that. And we will have a booth um, at Terra Madre, our Slow Food Turtle Island Association booth. So please come by and taste our um, white corn and our salmon and our uh, tepary beans and all the wild gathered teas, uh, acorn bread. And uh, we're going to have a delicious tasting and a few chef events with um, Sean Sherman, the sous chef, and others. Um, Loretta Barrett Oden, the, the grandmother of native cuisine and the chef movement, uh, who's Potawatomi. So that's going to be a great way to interact. We're also deeply involved with the indigenous Terra Madre pavilion that will be at Terra Madre, um, where you can learn also about youth events and immigrant issues. Um, and that space is dedicated to the larger indigenous Terra Madre movement. So please come and visit our booths and interact and learn. And here in North America, we have a few nodes in the Southwest. Like I mentioned, the Pueblos have been strong uh, food preservers, protectors and guardians as farmers uh, with the three sisters, corns, beans and squash and melons and so many good foods. So um, we have a lot of partners with the Pueblos, Taos Pueblo, Pueblo Tasuki Pueblo, Santa Clara Pueblo, all around Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, Santa Fe, Taos. And then we have a strong note also in the Northeast with the Mohawk Nation, the Seneca Nation, uh, the Onondaga Nation, again, proud farmers and seed keepers. Uh, we also have a node here in California with traditional wild gatherers, uh, Ohlone and Hoopa and Pomo, Coast Miwok, who gather seaweed and abalone um, from the coast and who also gather wild seeds and huckleberries and um, uh, hazelnuts and bay nuts and acorns from the forest. We're coming into harvest time. So we just love into harvest time, both for the wild foods and for the um, domestic farmed foods. And then we have a note up in the Northwest, which Pauline can speak to with our salmon uh, peoples uh, who are working hard to protect their salmon and gather their foods up in Washington state and British Columbia. Um, and again, we're facing some pretty severe issues though with the dams, with climate change, with the fires, with lack of access. Uh, and also a lot of the knowledge uh, is retained with our elders. So we're really urgently trying to um, work with our young people to transfer some of the traditional knowledge of how to gather and process and care for and, and feast these sacred foods and what we call first foods. So with that, I think I'll, I'll close and, and open it up. Um, and let's see, can we have Pauline's voice yet? Pauline, have you, let's see. No, not yet. So there's a little button that looks like a microphone on the right, It up on the very top, right under the exit, where it says exit, right underneath there should be a little button that says mute or unmute. If you, and maybe your speaker's not working. We'd love to hear you. Oh, goodness. I see talking, but I hear nothing. Um, I know. Maybe, and then there's also a chat function on the right. You could type in your comments if we can't hear your beautiful voice. 
<laughs> it's all right. Uh, Pauline, an another approach would be to phone in on the phone number and oh, we can see yes. you, but then you can also call and we sometimes find that that happens. Um, That's a great idea. Um, I, I also do see that we have John Kariuki, who is the, the coordinator for Slow Food Kenya, um, also joining us. And I don't know if John or, or we have two Johns, uh, John Eichert, who is very much there and, and uh, John Kariuki. Are you there, John? Um, well, maybe, maybe Melissa, maybe you turn it over yeah. to John. You want you, me to you carry? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> okay. Why don't, in the interest of time, absolutely. Let me share a little bit about, um, a little bit more formally about some of our slow food goals so that you're aware of, we are a volunteer organization. Um, we actually are trying to now seek some grant funds to help us with some more strategic planning, but we've been an all volunteer organization directed by a 10 member uh, steering committee. Um, so we are all indigenous um, from uh, Diné, Mohawk, Seneca, uh, Lakota, Anishinaabe, Opata. Uh, we have a great diversity of people on our steering committee that um, governs our association that is a formal association directly with Slow Food International and in partnership with Slow Food USA and all the other Slow Food chapters and, and communities. Um, our primary goal is to protect and revitalize the native foods and foodways traditions. So in that effort, we network with other indigenous communities locally, nationally, and internationally and support food sovereignty and indigenous rights initiatives, such as protecting wild rice from uh, genetic um, modification. And we're also interested in, you know, some of the economic benefits of small scale sustainable uh, projects, whether that is selling wild rice or um, Iroquois white corn. And for our food sovereignty definitions, you always feed your, your own community first. Um, you feed your elders first and your youth because the elders grew up with that food and often don't have access or haven't eaten it in a while. So it's medicine food. We have a slogan that food is our medicine. And so um, whatever we grow or gather or hunt, uh, we share it with our elders first, then we share it with our children, our youth, so that they get the taste of that food. They, wow, I've never had acorn bread, right? Or I've never had venison, deer meat, or moose meat. And it awakens this like ancestral knowledge and heritage. And, you know, many people say our own DNA gets happy because we're eating our ancestral foods. And um, that just awakens so many different things in, in all of us, but especially our young people. And then we share with our general tribal membership um, so that we all can eat our traditional foods. And then if we're fortunate enough or lucky enough to have some you know, additional surplus foods after the harvest, um, what we don't want to save for seed or the next generation, we then can market and sell and share through trade or through sa sales at farmer's market uh, with a wider audience. And so, you know, there's maple syrup out there. That's one of our traditional foods. Um, but how many native communities benefit from, economically benefit from the sales of maple syrup? You know, probably just a handful. There's uh, wild rice on the market, thank goodness. Um, probably half of it is domesticated non-wild rice grown in patties here in Northern California, sucking up a lot of water that we don't have. And it's sold as wild rice, but it's not really wild rice. It's that very black wild rice and shiny. Um, our wild rice should, as Winona LaDuke say, taste like a lake. And it's much more um, of a mosaic of browns and tans and some dark and some light. So it's more multicolored, more diverse in nutrients actually as well. And um, it should be hand harvested and wild grown. 
And so we do, thank goodness, um, have Native Harvest, White Earth Land Recovery Project, um, many other uh, nations who are selling uh, wild rice as an economic market. Likewise, um, Iroquois white corn, there are many farmers for that, the Oneida Nation, the Seneca Nation. Uh, we sell at the Cultural Conservancy. We're gifted wild rice from the Seneca Nation, pardon me, wild uh, white corn uh, from the Seneca Nation and grow white corn here in California. And it's adapted very well to these conditions. So after saving seeds and feeding our community, the urban Indian and our tribal community of San Francisco and Oakland, uh, we now have enough um, white corn to start grinding it up um, and uh, processing it and selling it to our communities and putting it in our native community supported agricultural boxes. So we do have an economic interest as well, but the cultural, nutritional and spiritual focus of protecting these foods is primary. Yeah, hi. Hi, Pauline. <laughs> Hi, Pauline, this is Jeannie. Okay. Um, Hello. Uh, what this really triggers is something that, that came up in conversations in Denver um, is this, and, and I wanted to maybe I could throw it to, to John to get involved in this um, and as a response is, uh, Melissa, you're describing, you know, the, the imposition of colonialism um, is an imposition of uh, homogenizing, robust industrial food system that impacts not just our our our, econo our local economies, our diets, but our identity. And and for someone who, John, you, you know, as an agricultural economist, you um, were very close to and understood the power, the 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 intellectual as well as the economic power of this imposition, um, how do we unlearn it? Are, are there some triggers to unlearn it? And, and th this imposition we are all a part of, we're also a, a victim of, and how do we unlearn these, these elements? Well, I, I think that's what we're talking about today is how we, how we unlearn that industrial model. Because we, we talk about monoculture with respect to cropping systems, but it's really monoculture is what we've had with respect to our overall culture. Our, our economy and our culture as a whole, because this industrial economic development basically has to specialize, standardize, uh, homogenize the whole system so that it works more efficiently. Now, the reason I say we're in the process of, of changing that is because of the failures of that industrial economic system, that industrial food system are becoming, uh, you know, hard to deny. Uh, you simply look around at what you talk about in terms of the, the hunger, the malnutrition, but also the degradation of the soil, the air, the water, the pollution, uh, the destruction of, of communities, even rural communities of the colonizing societies are being destroyed now. I say it's ironic now that we're, that we're colonizing the colonizers because we're colonizing American rural places all around the world. So I think what we have to realize is that nature is not homogenous. Uh, nature is not uniform. Nature is different in different places. And the different cultures that have arisen, the indigenous cultures and other cultures that were here before, are a reflection of what people learned over centuries that they needed to do in a particular place so that they could live and work and, and feed themselves in harmony with the nature of that place. And so rather than having a homogenous monoculture, we have to go back to having a, a diverse food system that's, that's place-based, that's cultural-based, uh, that respects the nature of the place and the people that have lived in, in that particular place. And so I think that's, that's what we're talking about here. So it's not just about, uh, and we have to connect those various communities, those various place-based systems, we have to connect those into networks. So ultimately we replace the industrial food system that we have today with, with networks of place-based, uh, cultural specific, place specific food systems that are linked together through relationships of integrity. And those relationships are tremendously important because we're kind of rebuilding the social fabric of our, of our nations and of, our, of humanity at the same time we're doing this. 
Uh, so we're rebuilding kind of the social fabric and we're reestablishing the, the roots, the cultural, ethical roots. And, and those are still deep in indigenous communities. That's what we can learn most, I think, from indigenous cultures, indigenous communities elsewhere, because they've preserved this sense of connectedness among themselves and the connectedness with the earth in particular places. And every place we go, there's a different culture because that culture arose out of a different place. And that culture eventually becomes embodied in the people of that place because we're all interconnected. But I think there's there's hope in rebuilding it. The agroecology movement's very strong in the international area. And, and th that's all about everything is interconnected. The, the soil, the air, the water, the plants, the animals, the people, the communities are all interconnected in a particular place. And because nature is different, each one of those agroecological communities, ecological communities, social communities is, is unique and, and, and is different because it's fitted <laughs> to a particular place. So I think that's where we need to go. And, and to me, changing that is to focus on hunger because that is the most obvious and I think the most critical shortcoming and failure of, of industrial agriculture and the industrial economy in total. And if, and if we can focus on, on relieving hunger, because if you think you're gonna get rid of hunger by economic development and look at the United States, you know, in the United States, we've got uh, one out of every eight persons in the United States is classified as food insecure. And one out of every six of our children in this country, the richest country in the world, still food insecure, doesn't know that they'll get enough food. And if you bring in obesity as a, and diabetes and heart disease and things of that nature as another form of food insecurity, which in fact it is, then the percentages are far higher. We, we can't solve this problem with an industrial food system. We have to return to an agroecological food system. And I think based on the principles of food sovereignty, which says everyone has a basic right to culturally appropriate nutritious food that's produced in a sustainable way. And every community has a right to determine their own food system. So these principles are emerging out of this necessity to, to change from the failed industrial food system that pushed us toward monoculture, not only in crops, but also in economics and also in, in the overall social culture. And now we're having to recreate and rethink everything literally from the ground up. And I think food is the logical place to start. <laughs> Thank you, John. Absolutely wonderful comments. So critically important. And, you know, I'm glad that you questioned the economic model um, because the seeds are so generous. The foods are so generous, right? We need a generosity model, um, which nature, if we're going to be true biomimics, um, we need to have that generosity model um, of abundance and sharing food and instead we've adopted as a general humanity and certainly uh, the capitalistic economic model of scarcity and that you know it, we have to compete for limited resources and yet you know you go out to one apple tree look how many apples that tree produces right um, you look at you know one corn plant you see how many corn cobs it produces um, you look at one uh, you know hazelnut bush so that nature is very generous and knows that it's going to feed animals it's going to feed um, the soil it's going to hopefully feed humans we have stories about you know that generosity model and the treaties between the plants and the animals and the humans so that everyone had enough right and it was shared um, it wasn't that oh there's not enough and I have to take it all for me and, and take it away from you and that scarcity consciousness as you mentioned I really liked how you framed it Richard of you know un how to trigger the unlearning of this colonialism and you know the the scarcity and fear and greed is very closely connected, I think, in the human psyche. And um, sadly, it's running amok in the world right now. And we really need to get back to a generosity model, especially with our food, so that nobody goes hungry. We The, the earth is so generous, even given the industrial uh, contamination and, um, you know, clear cutting and all the things that have really 
damaged a lot of uh, natural native foods. You know, our agriculture and the agroecology movement, like you said, is restoring those polycultures um, that can produce high quality food and enough food for all if they were generously distributed. I think the, the key to uh, moving to that uh, uh, culture of plentifulness is, uh, is, is learning to work in harmony in nature and living in harmony with nature rather than trying to conquer nature. That's what I was getting at. Mm -hmm. and, and I think where we are today, and this is a big controversy in the international area as well as here, is that some people see the flaws in the industrial food system and, and what they're trying to do is kind of minimize the negative impacts of that on, on nature and on society by environmental enhancement, various things of this nature. But in reality, what they're trying to do is, is in situations where controlling nature hasn't worked and has negative externalities, as we economists would call them, social and ecological externalities, what they're, they're trying to do is they're trying to, to separate the food system from from nature. If you look at the uh, 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 hydroponics, for example, or even even greenhouses, or you look at confinement animal feeding operations, or you look at at trying to uh, genetically engineer climate smart crops or things of that nature, that's saying, okay, if if we can't mitigate the uh, the negative impacts in any other way, then we'll simply try to separate. Uh, the food system and separate people from nature. And the alternative to that is the agroecology food sovereignty movement that says, no, if, if you work in harmony with nature, then nature is a, it, it has abundance that everybody can be well fed. And if we work in harmony with nature and we humans are a part of nature, then we'll see that everybody's well fed. The, the mm -hmm. problem globally is not production. It's not production in agriculture, no. certainly not here. There's plenty of, you know, there's all kinds of statistics that says there's more than enough calories, there's more than enough food produced for everyone. It's a matter of the distribution. And and we only uh, kind of get the incentive or the uh, initiative to go ahead and deal with uh, inequity and injustice when we re realize the value of relating to other people. That's, that, that's a, an economy of abundance as well in relating to other people socially with no expectation of what we might get back in return, just because that's the way we are. We're social beings. We need those relationships. And there's value in doing things that give purpose and meaning to our lives. And when we begin to focus on the social and the ethical uh, foundations, the spiritual foundations of who we are as whole human beings, then we begin to see the abundance in nature. And we see that nature can provide for all of these things if we work together and we work in harmony with nature. Absolutely. So, so Melissa, I think we have Pauline who has called in on her phone. We'll figure out which phone she is. So we might actually get to hear you, Pauline. Um, if, if I can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we yes. can hear you. Yes, we do. Great, I'll yeah. stop. Fantastic. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pauline. On. Oh, why? Okay, thank you. Um, do you want me to interject now or finish with John's questions? Go ahead. I'm, I've, I've had my say, so. Oh, <laughs> Polly, you got the floor. Uh, is this the word? Is this the time when I say the final say? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Why Haskell Halt squeezed Sui Geist? Why Chiap? Good morning, my friends and relatives. We have arrived. Uh, that's what that says. So, and all of us have arrived. I've been here, but with the technology um, and all of those others that are on the call, thank you, White Lim Lim, for taking the time for this conversation. I, um, I just uh, was so excited about this opportunity. Um, and invitation in terms of uh, the topic of uh, food being central to the rebuilding of our Indigenous nations. Um, and as John said, um, rebuilding all uh, of our nations and embracing diversity and thus rebuilding community and society. 
uh, from from an indigenous perspective, a colonized uh, uh, past uh, in which, uh, as Melissa has shared, uh, has had devastating impacts upon our people around the globe. Um, if if um, I was to provide uh, a context and a recognition of of the meaning of white chiaps, meaning we've all Can you give we all have a history, episode? we all have a heritage, but uh, a, we're uh, a larger human family, um, and for our field people, uh, and Chutin. Uh, placed us here in our Hello, territory remember, but, um, in the southern interior of British have Columbia. The, um, uh, generally, do you the have Pacific the access code? Uh, North do you have the access code? More interior, like the call in uh, Southern interior, British Columbia, Canada, and northern Washington State. Can I text? Cool and Chutin put I'll us to here to take care of the lands and the resources. Uh, and speaks to our creation stories of reciprocity and our relationship with the foods that sustain us and had always sustained us before there were two leggeds. Um, part of that uh, history, um, I have to and must always acknowledge um, the people that came before me, uh, my ancestors. Uh, my relatives that knew the values of reciprocity and sharing and sacred responsibilities of, of helping one another. Uh, we had a very vibrant uh, 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 trade and, uh, and economy um, in which, uh, in my understanding, um, our foods, uh, our intiktik, our salmon up the up the mighty Columbia River, in which we are Columbia River peoples, um, taught us as chief salmon around uh, difficult times of other people, other peoples, other neighbors, other relatives, in which may need our food um, uh, at times of hardship. No, Kenya is not on the list. Uh, our history speaks Kenya's to uh, an arch um, like the in terms of archaeology and anthropology research and design confirms uh, two large uh, salmon fishing camps in our territory uh, with a, a deep footprint of, of uh, trade and artifact that talks about uh, those tribes that Melissa spoke to along the Pacific Northwest um, and uh, inland around uh, and on the prairies with buffalo trading and as such a very large confirmed footprint of trade, item, trade items and artifacts that showed at the Kettle River uh, in uh, northern Washington state and here just a few miles down from where I sit in the heart of our territory at Okanagan Falls um, uh, on the Okanagan River, this Okanagan subbasin of the Columbia River, uh, where thousands upon thousands of Indigenous people met and traded and harvested food. Um, so again, underscoring the significance of our Indigenous food being one of them in Teak Teak. Uh, as part of the uh, the work that I'm involved in, I want to share a quote because I started with sharing, uh, acknowledging the ancestors that have come before me. Um, Melissa and I have a dear friend, relative, colleague, uh, Dr. Jidan Armstrong, who is a professor at University of British Columbia, Okanagan. Uh, and has been a leader and an advocate and activist and, and scholar in terms of Indigenous uh, advocacy and advancing of our culture, our rights to our homelands uh, and fundamental human rights uh, work around the globe. And um, uh, she quotes, and I read this at a place-based food systems uh, conference that I was invited to just a few short weeks ago at Kwatlen Polytech University. Um, 
part of their Institute of uh, Food Systems Sustainability Department. They sponsored this amazing conference uh, and had speakers from around the globe uh, there as well. And I started my presentation with um, uh, uh, my uh, sister's uh, excerpt from one of her uh, books. And she says, um, we're a part of this land yeah. it's a and ne a necessary called. part of it. The land needs us and the planet loves us. And we don't know how to be a part of that anymore. In a real sense, in a physical sense, a coming back to that is something that we as humans have to figure out together. And that's the quote in one of her publications uh, in 20, uh, 2007. Oh. And so that, that uh, excerpt and her dedication and commitment to that statement and her livelihood is, is, is what resonates for me in this call and what I've heard um, Melissa speak to and John speak to and, and Richard in his over uh, uh, his introductory comments about the purpose and the importance of, of uh, bridging community through uh, food uh, as, as it ha has always done in, in uh, preserving uh, and embedding our humanity as, as peoples. Mm -hmm. And um, with, with that work and with that dedication, has opened these opportunities for our people in our decolonizing uh, way of being. And that is through, in terms of uh, the community work we've done, uh, through conversation and uh, community engagement. Um, uh, as executive director of the Okanagan Nation Alliance, an organization, a bureaucracy, a government-dependent funded organization, while we advance our title and rights and, our, and do what we can to support the revitalization of our language and cultures and connections to others. Uh, in this world, I just want to, to say that um, our elders and our resource people, like our traditional knowledge keepers, like Jeanette, have been with us every step of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, even when we feel we are alone, even when we feel that what we are undertaking um, may not bear the fruit, uh, bear the uh, wealth of uh, uh, or the resources that we need to sustain ourselves as as uh, interdependent people again in terms of our connections to others and especially our land. We have a framework called um, the Four Food Chiefs. Surprise, surprise. Uh, it, it, it speaks to um, uh, the creation story we have around um, those uh, times before two leggeds came. And there's variations to the story and for the purpose of this call, as we know, our spiritual connection to our cool and truth and our creator uh, uh, of all good things, that all things have life. Um, they, they knew of the people to be. They knew um, uh, we were coming. And the, the, uh, the four food chiefs met. Uh, Skim Heast, uh, our bear, Intitik, our chief salmon, uh, Sia, our berry nation, and Spitlam, our root nation. And they counseled and they shared um, uh, and, and discussed uh, this time that these two leggeds were coming. And, um, and, and they said, what would they eat? And, um, and they decided, they made a pact as we were coming. Uh, and this goes to those universal indigenous values around uh, 
most commonly phrased as seven generations ahead. We think our decisions impact gener seven generations ahead. Um, in our language, in our creation story, um, that translation for us is um, we are thinking of the people to be um, and that have not arrived yet, white chiaps. And um, they said, we will lay down our lives uh, for the, the people to be uh, on, uh, based on that they undertake the sacred responsibility of us that sacred responsibility of always taking care of us and we will take care of you and uh, so our diets were very simple our diets uh, nourished us fed us sustained us um, for millennia and will again uh, because um, uh, we know uh, we believe and we have a vision uh, that that's not dark uh, that drives and motivates us for the people to be. And so our salmon story, it's an arduous journey and an arduous one yet to be. Um, we, uh, we introduce uh, sockeye salmon, our chief salmon, back into the Okanagan sub-basin as a research pilot uh, that took years of negotiation uh, with various levels of government and regulatory agencies over a period of 20 years. And that's a short time, actually. But, uh, but more than that, we have the Upper Columbia um, uh, salmon restoration efforts uh, to, 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 to lead and to take on. Um, with the reintroduction of salmon that was near extinction, um, the uh, model that we have and the belief, as I stated before, we had our traditional people along, along the way, we've integrated our language, we carry on our ceremonies, um, and uh, we bring the people together at all possibility, at, at every opportunity. And this, actually this coming weekend, we have our annual salmon feast in which it's our turn to give to give thanks <laughs> of our harvest because we've just finished harvesting uh, our sockeye salmon. We're just winding that up now. And we've also harvested our chief uh, uh, berry. Uh, and I have some here. <laughs> and that will, uh, that's our huckleberry. Nice. Uh, that is under, that's under threat as well. And me and my family, um, we have a very large family. Uh, we just uh, canned uh, 19 and a half cases of uh, salmon uh, for our large family for the winter this year. But we also, from the organization, we have what uh, Melissa talked about that we've taken to Indigenous yeah. Terra Madre, to, uh, Terra Madre uh, Salon de Gusto, in terms of the economic aspect of um, building relationship in community, uh, supporting local producers, eating our foods locally. Uh, it's been an interesting journey in terms of people saying we eat salmon out of the Okanagan River, right? Uh -huh. And so it's, 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 it's moving. Um, and, uh, and with that, um, we're building, uh, constantly building our uh, developing relationships with allies up and down the river, in the region, around the globe, uh, meeting wonderful people like all of you, um, that it would have happened eventually, but I feel blessed that I have the opportunity to be in all your company and be part of your conversation. So I'll stop there. Lim Lim. Mm, Pauline, thank you. Um, I, I do want to, I can't believe we're almost at the end of the hour, but we are almost there. Uh, we've seen an incredible stream of questions come in that reflected many of the, the points that the three of you said. I, I want to at least cite that John Karaoke has been listening in. He cannot get his microphone working. And from Kenya, the call in is, is difficult. I do encourage and implore any of you who are going to Terra Madre to seek out John and the Slow Food Kenya uh, booth. They will be bringing some 
memorable honey I know from Kenya. Um, but there was one question that really struck a chord that uh, I, I want to at least um, direct if we have time to, to tackle is, um, I mean, John describes, you know, we live beneath this, this, this uh, imposition of an of a, a industrialized colonizing agriculture. Um, Slow Food Turtle Island has emerged as uh, an expression of self-determination and something that we at Slow Food USA greatly encourage and, and support and want to be a good ally in. And often the question comes in from those of us who are trying to figure out how to be good allies. Is it, you know, endangered seeds and foods, um, is it for, 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 for important indigenous seeds, should we be growing them? Should we be supporting them? Do we buy the products? What is the best kind of um, partnership that, um, uh, and Pauline, you described up the Okanagan, you know, uh, uh, the, you know up the river, um, there has to be so many partners to make the, the, these extraordinary expressions of resistance, whether they're commercial or political, happen. Um, Raj Patel, in his, his comment that we, we posted, you know, described how the food movement and slow food chapters, we're, we're, we're not strong, we're weak, but when we come together, um, we are stronger. How do we come together? How do we support Slow Food Turtle Island's work, um, which spans beautifully across different political boundaries um, that we think of as political boundaries? Mm. Do you want to go first, go ahead, Pauline? Melissa. All right. Oh, yeah, well, in, in our few minutes, it's a beautiful, brilliant question. Thank you so much for asking. And, you know, the the consciousness and the humility of, of asking that question alone is, is really powerful. So thank you for that. And, uh, you know, we're uh, made up just in the U.S. alone of over 500 nations, Indian nations, Native nations. So the diversity is vast. And when you and Canada has how many in Canada, at least? Oh, I think over a thousand something. You have so many. Yeah, because many First Nations, the Inuit, the Métis. So we are very diverse with different languages, as John explained so well. You know, our culture spring from the different landscapes. So if we're in the forest, we're, we're having different foods and practices. If we're from the desert, if we're from the plains. So um, if communities are, are making products and selling their seeds or selling their food, such as the Okanagan um, with their beautiful salmon products, um, or the Wide Earthland Recovery Project and Native Harvest with the monome and the wild rice and the berries, please support purchasing the products, the Native American food products, even the Tonka bar, you know, the Tonka bar, that the Buffalo bar by the Braveheart family in South Dakota. It's the only real Native American, one of the few Native American products on the market that you can buy at Safeway that all those benefits go back to a Native company. Um, so that's really important to support and purchase those products. And the seeds are very delicate, but there's a growing seed keepers network of the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, who's uh, run by uh, Rowan White, the great Mohawk seed keeper. And she's been having regular town hall meetings as well to kind of talk through some of those ethical issues. Some people love sharing all their seeds as much as they can because this, the plants are so generous as we talked about. But some seeds are more delicate, they are more endangered, especially the wild harvested foods. In California, there's species of abalone. Now there are two and they're both extremely endangered. You can only maybe gather one in a very short window. And those were the traditional foods of all the California coastal people, and they can't get it anymore because it mainly has been over harvested for commercial markets and for poaching because it's so valuable, um, really, even on the black market, abalone, it's like, I don't know, well over $100 a pound. And so um, that's an example that you know, the California coastal people have said, we don't want, you know, our, some of our sacred foods to be grown or harvested by non-natives because then our own people who have an ancestral, genetic, historical, cultural, spiritual tie to those foods don't have access to them. So it's very complex and you have to look at each nation, wherever you are, be place-based. Who are the local people in your place? 
What kind of foods do they have and grow? Do they want to partner with you to revitalize some of those foods, to restore some of those foods and, and share them? So I would say it really has to be taken locally, place-based with the values and goals of the local native nation, whoever that is, because it's going to be very different. And it's one of the challenges I would say that we're grappling with in Slow Food Turtle Island Association in a good way that we have such a range of diversity of our peoples and our food traditions. Um, so we're working out our internal trade networks and revitalizing those ancient trade routes and sharing. And that will help us kind of see how to share with the broader uh, community. But in terms of reconciliation, which Canada is leading the, the charge with, we do have to reconcile this relationship between settlers and the first peoples. And so however you can do that with acknowledging you're on native lands, acknowledging there are local people, even if they don't have a reservation or don't have federal recognition, they exist. Their living descendants are, are present. So there's many different ways people can join the reconciliation process and become good allies and food is a great way thank you, thank you melissa thank for, you. For, I think for providing, for providing uh, some, some navigation, navigation because it is complex yeah. and, and, of and of course we want simple answers because our lives are so complex but there are no simple answers except i, I think maybe to operate as something that john described um uh, i'm thinking back to denver uh, the, 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 the humility that comes with establishing relationships based on trust and recognition that we share this, this land and um, um, stolen land, but we share it. And uh, I can't believe that we're at the end of the hour. I would love to carry on for another hour, but I, I do know that people's lives are busy. I hope that they got just just, just a, a soup song, just a taste of the kinds of conversations that are taking place in this global community. And if there is uh, native foodways that are beginning to become visible near you, by all means, find them. I know that um, uh, find them and support them and learn the, the, what, what, what resiliently exists beneath the imposition of homogenizing um, uh, aggressive industrial food system. And this is the, 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 the hope and the, the, the balance between the joy and the justice that we, we hope that these conversations start to lead us towards. Um, so whether it is finding, you know, learning how to find out what is going on through the gateway of slow food in your community, find your local chapter, um, connect with it, and hope that they can connect with others who are also leading the way to, to reinvent our relationships in the food system. If you are lucky enough to be headed to Terra Madre in the next, um, in the next week, by all means, you will find incredibly robust uh, uh, activities around the indigenous Terra Madre um, uh, uh, pavilion. Um, if I can uh, also put in a plug, which I know it'll compete with lots of other things going on at the same time in Terra Madre, is the, the, the USA national meeting, which will uh, merge with the meeting of the Americas, where, where Carla Petrini will be joining us, I think, around that same time, the indigenous Terra Madre opening gathering is taking place. Um, there will be many opportunities for infinite as well as large conversations um, in Turin, and then we hope that when people do return, is to, to, to connect with and find new partners and allies in in uh, the place that you you inhabit, and that we together can uh, reinvent the taste of place in a way that reflects um, uh, the integrity of self-determination. Um, and, and I think this complex idea which um, of, of sovereignty of choosing the foods because they are reflective of who, who you are who we are and um, and there's a lot of unlearning that needs to take place and we hope that this conversation could at least kickstart some of that um, and and we feel so lucky that, that um, uh, we were able to be joined by um, such extraordinary leaders and doers and thinkers uh, on this call, John, Pauline, and, and Melissa. And I'm sorry you did not get to hear John Kariuki from Kenya, 
good work we got to see firsthand at the international counselors meeting this summer and so inspired by its definition of bridging community. Um, this uh, conversation has been recorded and will be posted as a podcast on our YouTube channel. Um, by all means, look, Melissa, you will be in, in Turin, correct? Unfortunately, I'm not going to be there this year. I'm very sad, but I'm sending Maya Harjo, a wonderful um, young Native woman who's our new Native Foodways coordinator, and she'll be representing the Cultural Conservancy well and coordinating with Denisa Livingston with the Indigenous Terra Madre and Slow Food Turtle Island Association events. But we have a robust group of about 30 plus people. And Pauline, you're going? Are you going this year? No, um, you're not. I no, I won't be. We're trying, you know, everyone always wants to go, but we're trying to keep rotating in fresh yeah. people, yeah. Fresh people fresh especially people. young people who are so passionate about food justice, food sovereignty, and how it's going to help heal the world. So look out for a lot of the great young people there. That's, that's nice. I think the opportunity to meet new people and for new leaders to have that extraordinary experience is the the correct approach we're thrilled that today's call was international and though we are slow food in the usa we are slow food we're a global community and we're thrilled to have um uh this is a as a, a much more global call as we begin to forge global and local communities um uh be on the uh, on the ready for October will be a global campaign, the Food for Change uh, campaign, looking at food as a hopeful pathway to address climate change. Um, and the way that you connect to these is to connect to slow food. So whether to find slow food to the island, whether to learn about the Okanagan uh, sake salmon and where to find it is by all means hop online, look for key, these key words, this key work, and, um, and that we can uh, begin to grow together. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you for... Thank you for this opportunity and inv and kind invitation. Mm. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you for struggling to see the technology. Yes, you did. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank oh, you, Anna. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Yeah. Wonderful. Everybody, bye bye. Thank you all. Bye, bye, Wonderful to be with you. Good Same to here. see you. Thank you. Bye, bye now. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.